I'm Diana Felsown, and this is 4 for 4 Science, where we dissect four intriguing science topics in a manner PETA would be happy with. In a galaxy far, far away, Apollo 10 astronauts reportedly heard, quote, odd music on the far side of the moon. Mindy, is there a future lawsuit on the horizon for Pink Floyd versus aliens? Likely not. So, so this is in May of 1969, and this was essentially the dress rehearsal for the lunar landing. And what happened was, as the orbiter traveled around the far side of the moon, and essentially was cut off completely from all communication with Earth for about an hour, they heard what they described as strange sounds, whistling sounds, space, space agey music. And what it actually was, was radio interference between the command module and the lunar module. And not really an alien concerto. Aww. I like that science has given us an answer to this, but the amount of buzz there is around this story at the moment, like everyone gets to play Mulder and Scully, and I think that's kind of cool. You know, I like the fact, I like the fact that they were isolated on the far side of the moon. It kind of, I like the, the idea that it was music, but I like that we've also got an answer as well. It's just good. It keeps the space buzz going. Mm -hmm. well, what I think is so cool is they recorded this in 1969, but it wasn't really unearthed until very recently, I think 2008. So it makes you wonder what other recordings are hiding in the NASA archives waiting to be discovered. Ooh, conspiracy theorists. <laughs> I like that. No, it does really make you wonder what they're hiding, why it came out now, but it kind of killed the buzz of thinking aliens exist, which they do. NASA is working on a new propulsion system that could get a spacecraft to Mars in three days. That seems a little overzealous. James, is this really feasible? I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, it's a proof of concept at this stage. I mean, we know that the distances to Mars are so great that, you know, kind of the anticipating journeys there could take upwards of six months. Wow. But this, you know, scientists are looking at a new way of basically using Earth-based lasers to propel some sort of sail through space. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very ambitious. Early days for it, yeah. But, you know, to get to Mars, I think we're going to have to start thinking really, really creatively and looking at different things. Yeah. What I'm excited about is this year we do have an actual sail that's being propelled through space. They're launching something called Light Sail. It's a solar sail that basically the sun's rays pushing on it are going to be moving it, and that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, what's important to remember is that this is a proposal for technology that isn't capable of carrying people. So it's not going to get humans to Mars any, any sooner, at least not right away. But what it could do is it could enable us to send a lot more robotic, uncrewed probes to Mars, and that could speed up the process of developing technologies that could inform human missions to Mars. Right, because like what the researchers said, if we don't start thinking of alternative routes, we will not get there in our lifetime at all. While it's universally known that a scorpion bite can be deadly, researchers have found it's not necessarily from the venom, but the inflammation it causes. Sophie, what are these findings? Well, most scorpion bites are innocuous, but 3,000 people a year do die from scorpion venom from the more venomous ones. So researchers gave mice scorpion venom and saw how are their bodies reacting on the molecular level. And what they found was the bodies in, were responding with inflammation with these inflammatory systems. Mm -hmm. And so what they think might be a good way of treating scorpion stings in the future could be using an anti-inflammatory drug instead of using an antitoxin, which some people have allergic reactions to. That is true. Because I mean, the things that happen to you when you're unfortunate enough to be bitten by a scorpion, mm -hmm. it's terrible. Your lungs can fill with fluid, your heart can stop. The whole idea that there could be another way or other ways to kind of deal with this and could be, you know, help people in a lot of parts of the world where this is such a big issue, I think mm -hmm. it's great. It's just, it's so fascinating to see how scientists are harnessing the chemical compounds and animal toxins to try and control the way that they affect the human body. And not just in this study, but also using them to create agents for things like pain relief, which scientists are doing with cone snail venom and certain kinds of spider venom. And it's just a whole new way of looking at these toxins as a way that they could actually benefit us. Definitely. Scientists have discovered sharks have active socialized. If you watch Finding Nemo or The Little Mermaid, you already knew this. Kidding aside, Mindy, how do sharks socialize? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think many people think of sharks as solitary, but a new study shows that they're actually a lot more social than you might think. So mm -hmm. what scientists did was they implanted 20 sharks with these transceivers, which basically transmit and receive these acoustic signals that track their interactions with other sharks while they're swimming in the open ocean. And they found from the data from just two of these sharks, they had over 350 interactions with other sharks over the course of the year. And that's not much by Snapchat standards, but for yeah. a shark, that's pretty good. So <laughs> sharks like to hang out. I think it's really cool. But there were also there were insights in this, like there were certain times of the year when they wouldn't be as social. I think it was like late winter, early spring, and they found that basically the, the, the sharks were kind of like self-regulating their mm -hmm. time spent in social groups to go and do other activities like find food, find a mate, that type of right. thing. And you know, we know very little about sharks really, and it's given us a little bit of much more insight into what they do. Yeah.
I think the insight is great too because humans tend to be scared of sharks because of movies like Jaws, but realistically, cows kill more people every year than sharks do. <laughs> so it's crazy for us to be scared of them, and hopefully, studies like this that sort of show that they can be social animals will make us a little less. Well, I don't think out. it's crazy to be scared because if you get in an open cage with a shark, I think the <laughs> shark might win. But in terms of, of breaking down the boundaries and trying to understand how the shark's mind and the social interactions work is great. Now, I know we think tells what you think using the hashtag 444 science. I just want to know if sharks cuddle. <laughs>